the Martian investigators. Two spacecraft are about to fly by the planet Mars, returning scientific information and close-up pictures such as no Earth man has ever seen. The first man to see the pictures of Mars will be Dr. Robert Layton, head of a team managing television cameras aboard the Mariner 6 and Mariner 7 spacecraft. His associate is Dr. Bruce Murray. Optimistic, inquisitive, daring to reach and sometimes to overreach, these men share not only science, but also a saving humanity and humor. Well, last supper. <laughs> the last supper before the Mariner 6 spacecraft begins its flyby of the planet. This is Monday, July 31st. The two spacecraft were launched in February and March. Now Mariner 6 is about to begin taking its first pictures of the surface. These scientists, many of whom have spent years trying to study Mars through the shimmering atmosphere of Earth, will soon be seeing the first far encounter pictures of the whole planet. Then later, close-ups of its surface. Another Martian investigator is Dr. George Pimentel of the University of California at Berkeley. His instrument, the infrared spectrometer, will search just above the Martian surface for water vapor and evidence of organic compounds that could indicate the possibility of life on Mars. Now Mariner 6 is beginning that search as the spacecraft enters its far encounter phase and receives a critical ground command to turn on power for the scientists' instruments. Send DC-25 at 01-16-23. We'll know more about Encounter than we did since we started this business four and a half months ago. For each of the 20 scientists conducting the six major experiments aboard the Mariners, the flyby of Mars will be an exciting experience. This film will look at just two of these experiments through their chief scientists, Leighton and Murray on the picture experiment, Pimentel on measurement of Mars' lower atmosphere. Mars' fascination lies in certain similarities to Earth. It has a 24-hour day, light and dark areas that change color with four seasons and polar caps. Four years ago, Pictures from the Mariner 4 spacecraft showed craters and answered some questions about Mars, but many more remain. Are the polar caps water ice, which could support life? Or carbon dioxide, dry ice, which could not? Does the atmosphere contain Earth-like proportions of oxygen and nitrogen? Is the surface shielded from deadly solar radiation? What makes the shifting light and dark areas? And what do they look like close up? Now the instruments of Mariner 6 are beginning to encounter Mars, and the data containing their information and pictures are cascading to Earth through the intricate system by which engineers of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory have been directing and controlling the two spacecraft. Nineteen hours after taking its first far encounter pictures, Mariner 6 is ready to play them back. Dr. Robert Layton is about to see the first images. We get from that or this general resolution. I see the picture developing here. So here is our first view of Mars since Mariner 4. It's on. By spacecraft. By spacecraft. Yeah, I see some uh, interesting light areas near the upper limb, switch to speed. There are some bright areas near the uh, afternoon limb, the upper limb of the planet, uh, as you see them on the screen there. It's the bright feature that we were talking about, Bob, is still just right at the limb. We're seeing it edge on, it's rather... That's rather clearly a cloud, because so that is a cloud. Uh, it's uh, up at the top, brightly uh, top of the view. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting that that's an afternoon cloud rather than a morning cloud. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair that's, evening on Mars. That's in mid-afternoon. For men who have been studying Mars most of their lives, the distant pictures are already a revelation. So many things are showing up. I think the boys over here are finding fantastic agreement between features 
seen on the foreign counter pictures and features seen from Earth, but not the nature of which were known yet. One particular marking on Mars called Nix Olympica, for reasons I don't know, uh, which has been mapped for years, is a little, not a little, it's a 500 kilometer diameter crater, a circular marking with a light uh, boundary, light ring on the thing. And there it is, right in the, standing out on that far counter picture. As the spacecraft hurtles toward the planet, the investigators study the far encounter pictures to decide how they would like their instruments aimed for the near encounter pass. The best aim for pictures is not the best aim for Dr. George Pimentel's IRS. He would like his instrument to scan a uniformly light area south of the track the picture team would prefer. So that it, an interesting region came right in the region of overlap and they lost that overlap. They'd want to push the whole thing north. Okay, well, there you go. And, well, we're not going to lie. Mariner 6 is rapidly nearing its closest approach to Mars. The scientists have to decide whether to aim for the best pictures or the best data. Dr. Bruce Murray leads the argument for the picture team. The value judgment in this and also for 7 is what indeed you see in the dark side. As you point out, none of you have seen it. You don't know. And this could be, you don't know, what the upper area probably is, but that could be the most exciting thing of all. If there's an elevation yeah, but this difference could be the most exciting, and that's the yeah. place where we'll get the best information on both flights. But how about on set? I no. think you failed to no. appreciate no. the point no, I was trying that. to make, is that the re you're costing us eight pictures on the bright side of seven. Oh, come on. But just a minute. Let's Listen, let's come on. hear me out. Let's let's worry about about that. Just a minute. Hear me out. Hear me out, please. Because the argument is canonically the same kind of argument. You don't know what you're going to see. Bob is unimpressed with what you're going to see there. I am, look, too. I was unimpressed with what okay, we saw last minute. night. Just but I think you had to look. Just a minute. Let me I finish. think the issue that now is opened is whether you should look again. Yeah. Just because a minute. you know a distant encounter you don't see. But you're going to want to look again. May I finish, you? please? My point. <laughs> Do we have not much time? Well, make a proposal. Oh, no. Murray yeah. breaks the stalemate. No, he agrees to Pimentel's request for Mariner 6. In exchange, Murray and the picture team will have the right to aim Mariner 7. Two degrees south, three degrees south, one picture longer. Right. Let me take pictures of mine. Uh, these are yours. As Mariner 6 nears the planet, the second spacecraft, Mariner 7, suddenly stops transmitting. One by one, each station on the world tracking network reports no contact to project manager Bud Shermeyer. Stand by and, and uh, keep looking, and 11, if you see a signal, uh, call it out, and we'll see, uh, see what we can do. I don't want to discourage you, but they may not see it because of uh, degraded noise temperature. Well, you know what the problem is? Just an unscramble of data. Any indication so far of anything happening before the planet? Okay. The silence of Mariner 7 could be explained by collision with a meteorite or explosion of a gas bottle in George Pimentel's experiment. But right now, Mariner 6 is flying by Mars. Pimentel is learning that his IRS on 6 has failed to operate properly, casting further suspicion on his experiment as the cause for the failure of 7. E-52, G-361, Station 11 in Goldstone, California has picked up a weak signal from the missing Mariner 7. But the radio signal alone cannot report the operating condition of 7. No telemetry, just a signal that seems to be steady. It doesn't look like it's rolling around in the sky, or at least not tumbling around in the sky. It could be rolling. Without data, we're kind of a little bit blind. Now completing its flyby, Mariner 6 is playing back pictures taken only 2,100 miles from the surface of Mars. At last, Robert Layton will be seeing close-ups of the planet's face. Take a look at what's coming in now. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Look at those little craters. This is a narrow-angle camera view, and the scale on that is approximately 50 miles, about 50 miles across the picture. 
And so that means we're seeing craters there, the smallest of which cannot be much more than a mile or two in diameter. Would you say so, Brad? Perhaps even smaller than that. So this is as best, as good as the very best uh, telescopic views of the moon. Yes, 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 I think that's, oh, oh, yes, yes. True. Anything surprising in them? Okay. The numbers are very pleasing to us. Uh, it gives us a lot of things to count, to study, and a lot of clues as to what's happening on Mars. Of course, the absence of crater would have been interesting, too. But it would tell us a different thing. Isn't that amazing? Look at that. Must be similar in some ways. This is picture 21, a red picture, wide-angle picture, fantastic picture. Look at that big thing at the bottom. There are small craters there, clearly. There are small craters that are only a fraction of a mile. I can see several that are only a tiny part of a mile in size. Do you see a contrast between uh, an old crater, an obviously old crater at the upper part of the center part of the picture, and the very fresh craters, some of them almost of the same diameter in the lower part? We had Mariner 4, and on the basis of Mariner 4, we predicted tens of thousands of craters over the whole surface of it. Mars, and I think this fully confirms that the Martian surface resembles that of the moon very, very much. While close-up pictures were being taken, half of Pimentel's instruments on Mariner 6 did work and returned some exciting indications. This is the spectrum that uh, is surely ice. The only question is where is it? Ice? H2O? Ice? Yeah, right. You really think it's got water ice, George? Pardon me? You really think There's no got... question about it being ice. In your own words, right now, what is the most single significant thing we've learned? One sentence. We've learned that, that Mars' atmosphere is extremely transparent in the visible at this time, that the surface has very low contrast, huge numbers of craters, it's very moon-like, and yet there are tantalizing atmospheric effects which Mr. show up in... It's not true. Listen, the way you should answer that yes. question... I'll let you answer. No, really. You're talking about the photographability of it. Yeah. What we have learned now, new scientific information, is only two things right at this moment, or possibly three. One of them is this peculiar feature of the south polar cap. I didn't get into that. Well, no, but that's it. You're not, you've got a paragraph in a sentence. Wow. Well, we have learned that the south polar cap not <laughs> is not as man has always thought it has been. It is not a continuous blanket of white. Point one. Point two. That, that there is no blue absorbing matter in the, in the Martian it's atmosphere. It's clear that the proper answer to that question is it all depends on whom you ask. Well, no, I, well, I, I think you're going to get at it. Oh, okay, now what else looks good? What else looks good? The second spacecraft, Mariner 7, finally reports its condition. That's receiver static phase there. That's, that's good. Uh, pitch position and yaw position, those are good. Both, that's good. The... Uh, News of seven from NASA program manager Bill Cunningham. Seven, uh, even with the earlier problems that we had, uh, looks like it's in real good shape, anticipating a good mission. The investigators decide to broaden seven's coverage of the great ice cap over the Martian South Pole. Some pictures indicate a haze over the polar cap and dark outcroppings within and along the cap's edge. If the cap proves to be water ice, it could preserve the hope of finding some form of life if it's CO2, dry ice, Mars is more likely to be a totally desolate planet. The chance to fly over the South Pole is best in, better in this spacecraft than even the orbiters in 71. I mean, there may not be a chance for a decade to do, in practice to do this again. And so the polar cap may turn out to be the most exciting thing on the planet. It may be turn out to be the least exciting. We're going to find out, and that's what's important. August 4th. Mariner 7 begins its closest approach to Mars. The reason for 7's near loss remains a mystery, but the gas bottles on Pimentel's IRS are still suspected. No, the JPL people are the ones who think that uh, something went wrong with our gas system. The problem is there's no probable uh, theory as to what could have done what uh, has apparently happened to it. And, uh, are these all enhanced? So there's a natural tendency to look at our gas bottles because they're capable of doing a lot of damage. But anyway, tonight's the night, and uh, we'll uh, probably be back sometime tomorrow. I, I suppose the mail's about a foot deep, huh? 
Well, after uh, Mariner 7 arrival, I may want to go to Russia. The real moment is when we see what happens when the uh, signal to start cooling down the IRS happens, uh, occurs, right? Right. And we'll see whether... I think prediction was right. It's time. It's past now. You gotta hear DC 49. The moment of truth for Pimentel will be when he learns whether or not the two channels of his IRS are cooling. A temperature drop would be the first indication that his bottles were not responsible for Seven's troubles and that he will indeed get data back. Number one. Big news. That's that's the squibs got current. Well, he said the event. That event one was squib current. Miles said. Now they're going to say counter, not event. But there's another interpretation of the data. See significant effects in the cycles as we would not expect. We would expect to see disturbances. And you do not. You mean they think it didn't, the, the bottles didn't go? That fact, uh, control reports no effect from the pyroid valve. Hmm. That's not nice. <laughs> That's what's known as bad news. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it was quite readable. Catch it. Gas bottle blown down, they have to both be blown down. You don't want to blown down. That's right. See, this is consistent with the fact that the fire was moving. At that, uh, when Mariner 7 went through that transient. In other words, the event one did not mean that squib current flowed. Right. If we don't hear something in a couple of minutes, we've had it. Now, some data indicate that the IRS may be cooling. God, you're testing it. Whoa! Three minutes, 22, 23, 23. The IRS, the Channel 1 detectors call that's reached. Dr. Layton is seeing close-ups of the South Polar Ice Cap. I think we're getting a rather exciting picture being built up here. That must be a narrow, a narrow angle. angle picture, and well, we if can they can give us all of that, <laughs> we will indeed be excited. What a view, huh? What I'll a view. Say. <laughs> what a view. Incidentally, I think a view like that uh, convinces one, must convince one, that that deposit on the polar cap must be more than a, a fraction of a millimeter or a... Does it convince you of that? I, I, oh, don't, yeah. I don't see why I should be convinced. Perhaps uh, well, if it were a very thin layer, it would be such that it, by midday it would be gone, just as a little frost, morning frost on Earth, dries up and goes away immediately right. as soon as the sun rises. A thin layer of water ice would melt quickly, but a thick layer of frozen carbon dioxide, dry ice, could last indefinitely. The amount of carbon dioxide that could condense during that polar winter is a yard or two in thickness. Now that's a good sizable thickness and it's going to take a while for that to re-evaporate. Mm -hmm. To us that's a much more acceptable, imaginable view than that it's that little tiny thin layer of water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, uh, of course, both channels operated, and so for the first time we got a look at the uh, Channel One. <laughs> it's a little difficult recovering from all of that, you know. The best part was riding home last night with the data in our lap when we saw Mars. Yeah, we saw Mars at the windshield. <laughs> Okay. Let's go to Berkeley. Yeah. Dr. Pimentel walks out of JPL with his data. The only measurements near the surface that could show organic compounds, those possibly made by life. We'll be back tomorrow at five. And the most sophisticated measurements for confirming or ruling out the existence of water. Wednesday, August 5th. The scientists meet to discuss their findings among themselves before they reveal them to the press. Dr. Pimentel is in Berkeley, California, but joins the meeting through a two-way speakerphone in the ceiling. I'm curious, was that a hint that you think you're seeing something organic? Oh, yeah. You think you are? Did you say you're curious or furious? Curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, well, sure, that's, that's our optimistic hope right now. Right up here. <laughs> <laughs> what are the wavelengths of your organic bands? Uh... You'll see tomorrow, Don. <laughs> you don't want to tell us now. Right. I can say you, you can just picture the planet teeming with life. That's supposed to be a joke. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> with the press conference an hour away, Pimentel and his associate, Dr. Kenneth Herr, arrive at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. If Pimentel's results do indicate water ice, organic matter or other signs conducive to life on Mars, then he will directly oppose the other Mariner scientists. Four years ago... One by one, the experimenters announced the results of the flight. Dr. Layton's picture experimenters got back a fantastic 200 pictures of the planet. ...of that planet at a resolution that would... In the distance pictures, the experimenters saw the light and dark patterns on Mars with unprecedented clarity. But nearer the distinctions began to fade, and close up, the demarcations dissolved into other patterns, craters, some white rim, the snow, and mysterious plains and mountains. But one vast stretch of over 1,200 miles showed almost no craters, as if smoothly sandpapered by erosion or possibly covered by a fine and wind-blown dust. Another area that breaks the pattern of craters is a several hundred thousand square mile section with a chaotic jumbled look, as if the surface had slumped from beneath. The only identifiable cloud appeared to be a very thin streak hanging 20 to 30 miles off the edge of the planet. Dr. Gary Neugebauer reports an ice cap temperature very similar to that of dry ice. Dr. Charles Barth's findings include life-killing radiation that bombards the planet. At the press conference, George Pimentel is the last to speak. We were up, Dr. Herr and I, uh, almost all night last night with our computer trying to analyze our data. And I'm sure the other experimenters were too. And we've had no opportunity to try to interlock uh, the results. And I'm telling you the results as our instrument indicates. And insofar as uh, we may later proof to have to retract something or not. That's the nature of science. I'm telling you what our data indicate. We are confident that we have detected gaseous methane and gaseous ammonia on Mars. We are confident that we have detected solid carbon dioxide that is not on the surface. That is, it's suspended as a cloud above the polar cap. Our data are consistent with and suggest that the polar cap is composed of water ice and probably not solid CO2. 
certainly not solid CO2 near the polar cap edge. In the region near the edge of the polar cap, polar ice provides a reservoir of water. The solid carbon dioxide cloud provides protection from ultraviolet radiation. The geographic localization of the absorptions suggest that their origin is in this hospitable region, a region certainly deserving further exploration. Thank you, George. I think you can all see why science is fun. <laughs> The investigators reported their first evaluations under the pressures of time and fatigue. Dr. Neugebauer's measurement of the ice cap temperature may turn out to be slightly above the frost point of carbon dioxide. Later refined data by Dr. Barth indicates an upper atmosphere of mostly carbon dioxide with possibly a few percent of nitrogen, just what Earth's atmosphere would be without oceans. And Dr. Pimentel withdrew his original findings of methane and ammonia, which could have been life-supporting indications, but maintained his position that Mars has a partially water ice cap that is protected by a cloud of carbon dioxide. Curiosity, excitement, reaching and sometimes overreaching. These are characteristics of man that give science a human nature. That's all right, but don't ask me about life on Mars, okay? I can't, I can't feel that any person with any soul can look out on that universe that surrounds us and can imagine the immensity of it and the history of it without being rather impressed with the idea that we as little atoms made of the same stuff those stars are made of have the capability to regard the other part of the universe. One piece of the universe has the ability to look at another part of the universe and wonder about it. That's a very amazing thing, and it brings into one's mind all kinds of thoughts about religion and philosophy and so on. Okay, so long. Good. Long winded. WKCBS, Here we found some good pictures. So you, uh, you I think that's nice. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Uh, and then the one that goes with it. Yes, that's one. And then the footprint, but I. Yeah. I see how to save it.